The Awareness Virtual Lecture Series. Hi, I'm Matthias Hölzer from Ludwig Maximilians University Munich and I work in the Ascens project which deals with software engineering for autonomic service component ensembles. So the topic of today's talk is adaptation and awareness in robot ensembles. First question is of course, what are ensembles? What we do, do we mean by that term? It's uh, not something that you probably know. And it was coined in the Interlink project, which was a European project that tried to see where the computer science would be going in the next 15 to 20 years. And one trend that was very clear was that we'd built systems that would be more complex, much more complex than today's system. And not just because they do the same things faster or on bigger data sets, but they are fundamentally different because they really have massive number of nodes. So if you're talking about today's uh, computer networks, local area networks for which you're programming, you're typically programming for a couple of dozen machines or perhaps a hundred machines. Uh, or if you have a big web server, you have a lot of clients, but all the clients just pull down some information from your website. Now we have really for the first time large number of nodes which interact with each other. We have extremely heterogeneous computer systems. Now if you look Today everybody has their mobile phone, which is a very low power device, uh, which depends on batteries, so you can't really uh, force it to do a lot of computation. And on the other hand, you have these huge supercomputers, which can easily be accessed via networks, and you have the whole range in between. So you have lots of different computational devices in your systems, typically. You have much more complex interaction between the individual nodes than you traditionally had in your systems and what is probably the most important aspect of all you operate in an open-ended environment where the system never really stops and where you never really can do an update of the complete system so the environment is open-ended you get new requirements while the system is running and you have to adapt to these requirements and you have to fulfill these new requirements so these are problems that are very hard to tackle with today's software engineering methods. There are many different kinds of ensembles. For example, you have the power grid, you have vehicle systems, uh, all the vehicles uh, running in the roads, uh, which might be connected by some networks. You have grid computing, and uh, you have one thing that we want to address today. In particular, you have swarms of robots, autonomous robots working together. So why would you want a swarm of robots? Typically, swarm robots are very inexpensive devices and not po very powerful devices, but they can achieve much more when working together in a swarm. So one of the big advantages of swarm robots is their resilience to failure. If you have a swarm of 100 robots and a few of them fail, it's no big deal. The performance will not be significantly degraded. If you have just one or two big expensive robots and one of them fails, then typically you fail at whatever task you were working on. So some areas for swarm robotics where these characteristics might be particularly helpful are for example space exploration where you can shoot up a number of very small inexpensive satellites to perform the same task as one much bigger and more costly satellite. or rescue scenarios where you have some catastrophe happening and you need to rescue people and you need to see whether people are still left behind. In these kind of scenarios you expect a lot of failures, you expect robots, individual robots to fail frequently because there might be fires, there might be very difficult environmental conditions and still you want to achieve the overall goal of the task which is to rescue as many people as possible. So what do we need to build these kinds of system? Well, first of all, it's clear that to work in these extreme environmental conditions, to work in these very difficult environments, uh, the swarm will have to be adaptive. Whatever that means exactly, we'll come to that in a moment. And in order to achieve 
adaptation we might need something like awareness of what the swarm intends to achieve and what the goals are what the swarm should do and finally we need to have a model how do we model the swarm when we want to develop the software and that's actually the point with which I'll start what is a good model for these kinds of systems let me start by saying that the system model for ensembles I'm presenting is just to fix some model and some notation the notions of awareness and adaptation that come later are not really very much dependent on the details of the system model but we'll fix one so that we know what we're talking about and I have to tell you that I won't go into a lot of details and a lot of the mathematics for that you'll have to consult the slides which will be on the websites or the papers because uh, usually the big ideas that we're trying to convey get somehow lost in the mathematical details. So what I'm trying to do here is provide the frame of reference so that you can then easily understand all the technical stuff that's in the slides and that's in the papers. So our system model, how can we model such an ensemble? And the thing we're trying to do here is to reason at a very high level and that basically means we're looking at the input and output that each part of the ensemble does and then we're putting these things together into bigger components which have again an input and an output and so on we, we can repeat this process until we have all the parts put together. So what is the individual component in our system model? It's you might think mathematically input and output is something like a function but actually that's not general enough so what we have are relations so basically you measure everything that happens that you want to record and you build relations over these kind of things there's one further component in these individual relation sometimes you might need the individual state of the actors in the ensembles you might need to know what they are doing internally and you can also express that as one component of your relation so basically we have all the actors in the ensembles are relations and then we use some kind of combination operators which combines relations into bigger relation and which may add new behavior for example if you think of the actors in the ensembles of the robots of the robots in our robot swarm then when you combine these robots they have some behaviors that they don't have individually for example they might bump into each other or they might connect via grippers to each other and these behaviors would be modeled by connection operators so what we have is we have the individual parts actors, agents, components, however you wish to call them. And we have combination operators which combine them into bigger things. So that's the basic idea behind the ensemble. Of course, an ensemble is not something that just exists for no good reason. Typically, when you're talking about physical system, uh, this relational model would be enough to just describe the system because everything you want to describe is the behavior of the system. In the ensemble model, we generally want to build stuff that does something useful for us. We want to build systems that achieve some goal. And so that's why we need an additional component. We need to be able to describe what kind of goals should the system achieve. And to do this, we use as usual in computer science, when you're talking about goals, when you're talking about uh, requirements, we use a logical formalism and we connect that to the system model. This is not as straightforward as it might seem. There is a little bit of mathematical um, trickery involved but the basic thing is you want to have logical formulae which describe your system in a way that uh, is consistent with the system's behavior so if the logical formula says the system does something then this should actually imply that the relation has the property that is expressed by that formula so this notion of ensembles that we've just discussed is already pretty general but it turns out it's not quite yet the thing we need. 
Why? For two reasons. One is right now we can only say it satisfies the goal or it doesn't satisfy the goal. Often this is not what we want. Often we want to have an optimization process. We want to say, well, do it as well as possible. Or we want to compare different ensembles and say, well, this performs better in some sense. And to do this we need more than just a logical formula that says does fulfill the property or doesn't fulfill the property. We need a kind of utility or fitness function. And we call ensembles which have this kind of fitness function heterostatic ensembles. The second thing we need is right now we only have non-deterministic behavior because everything is a relation. But what we really want most of the time is another extension. We want probabilistic behavior. So we can't just say which are the possible behaviors, but we can also say how likely is the ensemble to exhibit a particular behavior. So what we can do is we can say, well, this behavior is possible, but it doesn't happen very often. So we maybe don't have to be as concerned with that behavior as with the ones which are more likely. So now that we've discussed the system model for ensembles, let's take a look at adaptation first. Well, what is adaptation? There have been various notions of adaptation defined in the literature, but none of them was exactly adequate for what we needed to do in the Ascents project. So we defined a somehow more general notion of adaptation than most of those uh, that have been discussed previously. It turns out you want to have two different notions of adaptation. Uh, the first one is what we call black box adaptation. Uh, that's when looking at the system from the outside and just watching how the system operates. The second one is what we call white box or glass box adaptation and there you really look into the individual components and you try to see how they achieve their adaptation goals, how they work internally to achieve black box adaptation. So these are the two notions, white box adaptation you look inside, black box adaptation you just look from the outside at the systems. And this notion of black box adaptation is what we will be discussing next. So how could we measure or how could we define this black box adaptation? Well, the point is we need an environment and we need the system and we place it in the environment. How can we express this in our model? Well, it's quite easy actually. You just define the environment as another kind of agent, of another kind of relation. And the placement of the system in the environment can then be expressed via a combination operator. And then we have a goal that we want to achieve and we already know how to bring goals together with systems. So basically we have everything that we need for the definition of black box adaptation in our system model already. It turns out that there is one more thing that's convenient, not absolutely necessary, but convenient. Usually a system and the environment, they don't interact directly, but there's something in between. For example, in the case of robots, you have the sensors and the actuators, which actually cause the program to influence the environment or deliver information from the environment to the program running on the robot. And usually it's a good idea to keep the system as small as possible and to only put these things into the systems that you can directly control. So what we're doing is we are taking the system and environment and a link between the system and the environment, all three expressed as relations, and a combination operator that turns them into a new whole. Then we can say, well, a system works in an environment if the combination of system environment and link between the two satisfies the goal that we want to achieve. So this comes very straightforward from our notion of a uh, system model. And uh, then we can say, well, what do we mean by adaptation? We generally mean that the system should not only work in a single environment. If you just have a system that just works in a single environment, that's not really adaptive. But what we want is we want a whole range of environments into which we can place our systems and it will still satisfy the goal. So the basic notion for adaptation is what we call the adaptation domain. Mm -hmm. 
which is a triple consisting of an environment, a link between the system and the environment, and a goal that we want to achieve. So it's environment, link, and goal. And a triple of that is an adaptation domain. Now we can take the system, put it together with the adaptation domain via some combination operator and see if the goal in the adaptation domain is satisfied. So we get the first uh, idea what adaptation might be about. And uh, this is already quite good, but the problem is it's very difficult to compare adaptation domains. So we want some notion of uh, system A is more adaptive than system B. And it would be possible to do it with adaptation domains, but it's a bit difficult. So we take one step further and we take sets of adaptation domains. And we say, well, a system can adapt to such a set of adaptation domains, which we call adaptation space, if the system can satisfy all the adaptation domains in the set. And what that buys us is that we get a very simple set theoretic notion of uh, system A is more adaptive than system B. It's just if it can adapt to more adaptation domains in a given adaptation space, then it's more adaptive. Now what we can see from this definition of adaptation uh, is already quite interesting. For example, there is no thing as adaptation in itself. It's always adaptation with respect to certain goals and certain environments. And you can easily show mathematically that if a system A is more adaptive uh, than a system B for a certain adaptation space, then you can find another adaptation space where this is reversed, this relationship. So there's no such thing as system A is absolutely more adaptive than system B. It's only for these kinds of situations that I want to take into account system A can do better than system B. Let's now look at a small example for black box adaptation. If you have two large computers and a large high bandwidth internet connection between them, this is very easy. The first computer can just compute the list of prime numbers and transfer the completed list to the second computer. Now what happens if you have a large list of numbers to compute but only a low bandwidth internet con connection between the computers? Well what you have to do is you have to change your strategy and not try to communicate this large list of numbers but instead perhaps a small program so that the second computer can uh, compute the prime numbers on its own. The same thing applies if you have high bandwidth, but if the computer, the first computer which should send the prime numbers, is not powerful enough to do a large computation, say if it's a handheld device. So in that case as well, you have to adapt and send only the program to the second computer. Now there are a number of more difficult scenarios uh, where you could have even further strategies. For example, if you have a powerful computer but access to an even more powerful cluster of supercomputers, then you might want to send a different algorithm, something like a parallel sieve, to this cluster of supercomputers to compute the problem in shorter time. Or what happens if you have two devices which are both not powerful enough to compute the solution? Well, in that case, you have to be more flexible and try to find a bigger computer which comp can compute the solution for you and then send the solution on to the second device. So you can s uh, see that there are various scenarios in which you need different strategies to achieve your goal and we can say a system is more adaptive if it can achieve its goal in more of these scenarios than another system which can't work in many scenarios. And so we come to the final point of this talk, which is awareness. Awareness is somehow different from adaptation in that you can't really define awareness as we understand it from the outside of the system. So to see whether a system is aware of something, you have to look inside the system and see what's inside the system. If you think about the notion of awareness, there are various senses in which the word is used, but one of them is something like knowledge, but a bit more than knowledge. It's kind of knowledge that stays consistent with the actual world. So you might be 
aware of a city and its layout, but to have better awareness you should also know that there's a construction site somewhere which will block you when you go there by car. So our notion of awareness is something like knowledge that's updated and kept correct over time. Now what do you need for this to work? Uh, for this you need some kind of internal model of the thing that you are trying to be aware of. Uh, what you have is an internal representation of something external. So you have, for example, if you're trying to be aware of the Eiffel Tower, you should have something inside the system that actually represents the Eiffel Tower. This does not necessarily have to be in a symbolic manner, uh, like a logical formula, describing the tower. It could also be, for example, the weights in the Zambesian network or something similar. But you need something inside the system that talks about the Eiffel Tower. Now, there are various points. First of all, usually this representation is not exact. It's the same as with a map. A map is never as exact as the real terrain, otherwise it wouldn't be useful. So you somehow need to have a coarse-grained model and uh, you can vary the amount of detail that you have in the model. You might think that having a more refined model is always better, but this is not necessarily the case. So you might have a very sketchy model of the Eiffel Tower, which is ju just a few lines, but which describes the rough outline. This is not detailed, but it is an adequate model. On the other hand, you might have a very, very detailed model of the Empire State Building, which is not a good model for the Eiffel Tower if you say, well, this is my model of the Eiffel Tower. So the level of detail does not really necessarily correspond to the quality of your model. On the other hand, of course, if you have only very coarse-grained models, there are not too many aspects of the real world that you can actually capture with your models. So one aspect of uh, awareness is how good is your model. The second aspect is how quickly can you update it when something in the environment changes. Can you really do it in real time, which basically means you have to have a sensor watching that part of the environment directly, or at least get some information from somebody who has a sensor like that. Or is it sufficient to update infrequently, maybe once a week or something like that. And to capture all these different aspects of awareness in a simple mathematical model, what we do is actually we define a function from the internal models to the environment and a distance measure, which is basically a function that tells you how far apart two things are. And the distance measure between the image of our model in the real world and what actually happens in the real world. And given that distance, we can then see how well our awareness of some aspect in the real world works, how aware the system is of this part of the real world. Given this model of awareness, we can then very easily go to self-awareness because if you think back in our system model, everything is a relation. So the system that we are trying to model is a relation itself. And so some part of that relation might actually correspond to the overall relation. So you might have some internal model that tells you what is my behavior or what is my interaction with the environment. And given that internal model, that is a self-awareness model. So now I've given you the overall ideas behind our concepts of awareness and adaptation and the system model that we use to describe ensembles. Of course there's much more to it for which you have to consult the slides on the website or the actual papers to get the mathematical details but you should have a rough overview of, of what we mean by these terms. Thank you very much for listening and uh, take care. The Awareness Virtual Lecture Series.